first guest is filmmaker, journalist, radio host James Farr. James is a resident of Pasadena. He's a husband, a father, a social activist, a social entrepreneur, and he has made an outstanding film about a very troubling incident that you may know about involving a young Pasadena resident and the Pasadena police that took place almost one year ago, where there was uh, a use of force, in the opinion of a lot of folks, an excessive use of force. So James, welcome, we're looking forward to this video that you've made. Uh, our second guest is a friend and a colleague, Skip Hickenbottom. Um, tonight, obviously, as you know, our topic is uh, police accountability in Pasadena. What needs to be done? And the goal, I just want to state at the outset, is not in any way to vilify the Pasadena police. That's not what we're here to do or engage in. As a matter of fact, I was on the board of the Pasadena Police Foundation for 14 years. And I have to say that during that time, I gained tremendous respect uh, for the intelligence dedication and integrity of the officers that I met, as well as the leadership. Uh, and they were, in many ways, a very impressive group of people. Uh, so we're here to look at one particular case, maybe that has gone wrong, uh, where someone's rights were violated and he was harmed, and we're trying to explore that and understand what can be done to prevent such things in the future. I'm going to give you, there are a few uh, professors and teachers here tonight, I'm going to give you a little quiz. I'm going to read a list of names, and I want you to think and tell me what they all have in common. Keith Scott, Terrence Crutcher, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Christian Taylor, Samuel DeBose, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Quan McDonald, Michael Brown, and Eric Arden. They've all been killed by they're cops. They're all, they're all unarmed black males, different ages, no, and they're no. 12 years old, who were unarmed and were killed by police officers yeah. from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and, you know, that's the list we have, who knows, but there may not be others uh, who are not on that list. Uh, so what's the overall context of, I would say, police killings? Um, in the United States. According to the Washington Post, just under 1,000 Americans or people in the United States are shot and killed by police every year. And that's from 2015 through 2017. And now in 2018, we're on track. There are approximately 180, uh, sorry, 842 people that have been killed this year by police. And that's people of all backgrounds, all races, all ages, etc. What's interesting is that of the people who have been killed over this period in uh, 2018, 22% are blacks, but the black population in the U.S. is 13%. So what does that tell us? And in this year alone, 13 unarmed black males have been killed and you may have also read or heard about what happened in Chicago this past weekend when the security guard outside of a bar in the suburb uh, confronted a gunman who came into the bar was shooting the security guard and after him into the parking lot. He subdued, subdued him. The 26-year-old security guard pulled his own gun and held it on the guy's head until the police came. And then the police came and shot and killed the security guard. And the question is, would they have shot and killed him if he were white? No. Or was, did he pay a higher price because he was black? And he was doing his job and he was doing it heroically. Now, so the question might be, when we look at these statistics, is there an epidemic going on of racial profiling, of beatings, of violence, and killings against black people? Is it an epidemic? And are we in the midst of an epidemic and an upsurge today? It's interesting that in 2008, 10 years ago, the uh, ACLU of Southern California did a study. And what they concluded was the following. Blacks and Hispanics are, quote, overstocked, overfrisked, oversearched, overarrested. Black pedestrians and drivers 
have a 3,400 times greater chance to be stopped by LAPD 10 years ago than whites. 3,400 times. And Latinos have a 360 time greater chance of being stopped. So the question is, what's going on? Is it an epidemic? Now, Peter Dreyer, who's written about this quite a bit, said an article that appeared in the American Prospect magazine in July of 2016, uh, the following, he made the following conclusion. Because more incidents of police abuse now being captured, are now being captured on camera, white Americans are waking up to how different black lives are. I think Peter said it well. So that's exactly what we're dealing with tonight. Only what we're dealing with tonight is not a situation from Ferguson, Missouri, or Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or St. Paul, Minnesota, but right here in Pasadena. And as I mentioned, on November 9th, 2017, a bystander video captured Pasadena Police Department two officers using force against a 21-year-old African-American man, by the young man by the name of Chris Ballou. That video was posted on YouTube. It went viral in the United States and around the world, and more than a million people saw what happened. And it's a lot of embarrassment to the city of Pasadena. So first, we're going to listen to a presentation and watch the film that James has made about this incident using bystander and dash cam video. Then Skip is going to tell us about the policies that need to be changed to prevent something like this from ever happening, assuming that we believe it's unjustified, and how we in this congregation and this community can help. Finally, we'll have questions and answers. We hope to answer everything that you have to ask, and then we'll adjourn to our social hall, and you can then talk with Chris Obersalzer about getting involved in the Citizens for Increased Civilian Oversight of the Pasadena Police. Now it's my honor to introduce James Farr. And uh, James, I'd like you to kind of come up and start the video. I'd also say, James, we're especially grateful to you for coming tonight and taking the time to be with us. James lost his father just under a week ago, so he's in mourning, but he said, in order to be here, he would honor his father because his father would have had the same message. And you can see James and his father look alike, and here's a picture of James' father here. He's a really handsome guy. So, James, come on up. Thank you. Many of us have to live our lives dealing with the consequences for something that we did not start to work and we finish. We're going to talk a little bit for just a little bit today, this evening, tonight, if you will, about the experience of making this film. It's not going to be a film school class, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the process of making a film. But what I will share with you, usually when you make a film, you have multiple assets to help tell the story. I was left with a film of two minutes and 26 seconds that I had to expand out into a 30 minute uh, presentation and then later into some other. Uh, so when my editor and I first sat down to, to work on this project, we, first day, we had to take a break. Because as you're watching this assault or an attempted murder as I, I've called this, this piece. It got to a point to where I know the cadence of how bad they whipped Chris's ass. So I had to replay that over and over and over and over for about 35 to almost 40 hours. That became seared in my memory. That was traumatizing. That was triggering. That was very difficult to watch. And now that we could produce this piece, we got a chance to show it a few times here in town. And people have, you know, been in that rage phase. But they haven't done anything. None of you have done anything. 
So I'm going to invite you to do something. When we get into our discussion, I'm going to update you on some things that are happening with this case that have not been made public yet. What I will tell you, it is business as usual down on Garfield. Mm -hmm. And the value of a life of an African-American young man seems to have little value. Rabbi ran off a list of names. I hope the next time we're here, we're talking about something a little bit more joyous and celebratory. Mm -hmm. um, this is not my favorite thing to do, but it is very cathartic. Um, it, it allows me to heal. And, um, so we'll turn, I'll turn it over to the rabbi. And, um,